It is my great privilege to uh, introduce uh, General Hayden. So we have a circumstance here where the unknown is going to talk to you about the known. Um, I'm the chairman of the Jamestown Foundation and uh, have been chairman probably as long as you've been, you joined the board just as I became chairman. And so I've had this incredible privilege for the last eight years of working uh, with General Hayden. I don't need to repeat to you his, um, his long and, uh, and well-known and highly respected resume. Um, he obviously, in 2001, when the attacks occurred, was right in the thick of it at the NSA, later at, at the CIA, and um, has remained uh, very informed and involved uh, since he left um, the government and has been a staunch supporter um, of Jamestown. And here he is again to speak to you. So welcome, General Hayden, please. Thank you, Will. Um, to give you, I know you've had a very productive six or seven hours. And, and imagine my task now, all right? You've had all these experts laying out information to you. You've had a chance to interact, ask questions. And now you bring the old guy up here to try to say something meaningful and interesting after, after all that's been laid out for you. That, that's quite a challenge. So let, let me offer a few observations. Number one, um, a, a bit of an homage to, to the Jamestown Foundation. It's not every organization in Washington that can have the National Security Advisor break lock with the President, walk, walk across uh, the avenue here, and come spend time with you in the morning. So, so that gives you some sense as to the degree of respect with which Jamestown and its work is, is held uh, by those uh, in and out of government. So uh, that, that's a, a very important I think, observation that I have to offer to you. The second is, I, I caught the back end of, of the discussion here, and it, it really reminded me of my time at CIA, all right, where, where you, know, you had really bright young folks, really engaged, really involved, really knowledgeable, trying to, to, to walk someone like me through the, through the intricacies of a very, very complex environment very, very complex problem, and it was all I could do to, to keep up, to understand, absorb enough to be able to communicate that to, to the president or the national security advisor, or at least create the circumstances where those bright young folks, like you've seen here today, all day, get to do it on the agency's behalf to the president. The value added I had was, was not trying to take notes on the experts and pass it you know, through the transom in the Oval Office. If, if I had any value added as director, as any director, as Leon would do, as, as Mike Pompeo needs to do now, is, is to not just absorb what your experts are telling you, but then try to put the, the fact, the detail, the narrative that the experts are developing into the broadest possible context so that you can communicate that. I mean, that's your value added. You've got the space to do that. While, while your analysts are there, you know, kind of chiseling away at, at, at the fine print of what's going on. So kind of what you've got for me, and, and I think what Willem has consistently invited me to come and end this conference with is, how would I put all the wondrous information you've absorbed today into a broader context? What are, what are the things I would be trying to think about as director to, to make sure that the the National Command Authority was aware of, even as we gave them the fine print that only uh, these experts can give them. So that's what I've got. I've got four or five things I, I, would, I would just want to, to share with you. Uh, I, I think it pivots off of what you've heard, uh, but I hope it's additive to it and, and not, not repetitive. So, so the first thing I, 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 would, I, would, I would try to make sure I gave a sense to the president. This is probably not as explicit as I'm going to make it to you, uh, but, but I would want to have the president to have a sense. Uh, and I thought this through after the two most recent attacks here in the United States, the, the one up on 42nd Street, which blessedly was so unsuccessful, the one on West Side Drive, which unfortunately was, was more success, successful. And, and what I thought of at that point, what came to mind as I reflected on them, what was the word limits? Right. And, 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 and by that, I mean the, the practical limits, and you know, uh, intelligence officers never say never, 
all right? And, and you're always aware that things could go very dark very quickly and get very bad. But fundamentally, what I would try to communicate to the president, the idea of limits, the, the limits of what our enemy is currently capable of doing to us. And what I think we, what we saw on West Side Drive is, is part of that band of things that I think are within reach uh, of our enemy. And I also would try to communicate in my own way the limits of our ability to stop that. All right, we, we, we are kind of in a, in, a, in a point of stasis, I think, in terms of threats to the homeland. It's not 9-11, all right? But then again, uh, I wouldn't be able to come into the president after the West Side Drive event and, and say something along the lines of, Mr. President, if only we, I don't know how to end, I don't know how to end that, I don't know how to end that, end, end that sentence. Uh, let me take you, I would never do this with the president, but let me take you on an extended sports metaphor with if my wife were here, she'd be rolling her eyes uh, at, at, the, at the prospect. Um, but, it, but it's soccer, all right? Um, I, I would describe what it was we were doing against international terrorism pre-9-11 as, as playing soccer in our goal mouth, all right? We, we, all of our players were the 18-yard 18, 18 line and in. And any of you with experience with what the rest of the world calls football knows that is not a winning strategy. You know, that, that sooner or later, that ball is going into the back of the net if, if all you're doing is playing inside your own 18. And a lot of things changed after 9-11, but fundamentally, in my soccer metaphor, we started kicking the ball up the field, all right? And when we began to play in all, you know, soccer divides the field into three zones, a kind of a defensive zone, a transition zone, and, and an offensive zone. And one of the more dramatic things we did, we did after 9-11, is we started playing offense. All right, we, we, we started making these other guys worry about their own goal mouth, worry about their own 18, worry about their own box. All right? And, and this is where I came in, and a lot of folks like me, and we controlled the transition zone. All right, between you know, offense and, and defense in soccer. That's the terrorist surveillance program. That's penetrating Al Qaeda cells. And, and we controlled the, the transition zone so well that I, I think a lot of people like me are saying, you know, that complex, multi actor, slow moving plot designed to create mass casualties against an iconic target? Eh, that's not going to happen. We have too much control over the transition zone. All right. What happened on West Side Drive, though, never went through the transition zone. All right? there, 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 there are no threads that, that we've got so good at detecting for that old-style attack. And, and so now we're, we're faced, um, and again, it's, this is still Roman numeral one on big thoughts to share. Uh, now, now we're faced as, so what it is we do about that? Since it's, the transition zone doesn't affect it. Well, one thing is you, you still play offense. All right, you, you, you still attack, and you, you still make them worried about their own goal mouth. But I don't know that there's a whole lot more to be done inside our own 18 after this attack and remain who it is we want to be. And, and so I guess the thought I would share with you, Mike Leiter, former head of the National Counterterrorism Center, really, really bright guy. Mike, Mike and I routinely, periodically have breakfast at the McLean Family Restaurant. And if you're interested, more case officer meetings happen there on a given weekday than happened in Portugal during World War II, all right? Um, and, and Mike and I were of the common opinion uh, that the existential threat to America posed by terrorism is not the terrorist attack. It's the American response to the terrorist attack. And, and so I, I would simply caution as, as, we, as we grieve over the West Side Drive and so on that, that we be careful uh, about trying to get that threat to zero because we may do more harm to ourselves. You know, pretty easy to work the, the transition zone, all right, and to stop that big attack. But to go much further inside the 18, I think, would, would hey, I'm a surveillance guy. And even I would probably tell the, the president, there's not much more you can give me that's going to give me a significantly higher probability I'm going to detect that. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, Willem and I were talking before we came in, and he reminded me, and I said, Willem, oh, no, I, I got it in the talk. He reminded me three or four years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this bit 
in the, in the batting order here, and I say, absent a change in American policy in Syria, the best option I can think of for the future is Assad wins. All right, and that, well, it created a disturbance in the force, all right, and an awful lot of uh, Al Jazeera went crazy with it uh, by, by that evening. And, and, and what, I, what I simply said was, if we're not willing to change the realities on the ground, if we're not really willing to change the, the, the facts on the ground, there are, only th there are only three outcomes here, all right? One is ISIS wins, one is nobody wins, which is really horrible to contemplate. And the third is he wins. And I said, so absent an American willingness to change the facts on the ground, you know, the best that's going to come out of this is the government survives and Assad continues to rule. Eh, guess what? <laughs> Assad survives, the government continues, continues to, roll, uh, to rule. Um, we have, and, and I know HR was here this morning, and, and, and uh, he, he should have told you about the tactical battlefield successes we've had against ISIS, and, and that's, that's a big deal, and, 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 and they deserve uh, congratulations. Now, I, I, would, I would call the, the Trump administration policy towards ISIS as Obama plus. All right? there, there aren't any hard turns. Uh, but there is an increased emphasis, certainly more freedom of action at the tactical level. So anybody of my background says, thank you, Lord, uh, for allowing us to make decisions at the tactical level, makes you more effective. Um, not loosening rules of engagement in terms of, of you know, our, our, our moral or legal responsibilities, but certainly a more aggressive um, stance and probably a few more resources uh, thrown at the problem. And so Obama plus in terms of punishing and de physically defeating the caliphate. Um, we have also seen continuity between the Obama and the Trump administrations, in my view, in an absolute unwillingness to, to actually embrace what happens after you've killed, killed ISIS. All right, the, 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 the Obama administration, I think, was, was famous for pushing back. I, I, I know that uh, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of the CIA, all pushed for a more aggressive policy, and the, the President Obama, for his own reasons, said, no, no we're not going there. And, and I, I think we're seeing uh, somewhat the same from, from President Trump. And I've, I'm looking forward to the national security strategy coming, coming out on Monday. Um, maybe I'll actually see the sentence or two that says what it is we intend to do after we have physically defeated ISIS, but I have not seen that to date. And, and, and what we've got here uh, is, is a fracturing of the patches of land we used to call Syria and Iraq. And, and I, I said it last year, well, I'll, I'll repeat it this year, they're not coming back. They're certainly, I, I, frankly, I don't think they're coming back at all, but they are certainly not coming back as the unitary states that, that, they, that they once were. And I fear, and I, 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 with, with some confidence, I fear we, we, we have simply quietly allowed ourselves to outsource the political solution to post ISIS, Iraq, Syria, to the Russian Federation. And so you had that sequence in Sochi about two weeks ago where the presidents of Turkey and of, of Iran and of Syria all made their pilgrimage to, to Sochi to talk to, to Vladimir Putin. I, I just don't think any good comes from that. Uh, I just don't think that creates a stable resolution at the, at the political level. Uh, what was really perverse, and I, I think this is right, um, what's really perverse is that we've seen uh, the, the, what I would call the forces of darkness here, so that's the, the Alawite army and, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and Hezbollah, supported by their Air Force of Choice, the Air Force of the Russian Federation, literally in, in, the, in the racing car sense of the word, drafting on, on the American, Kurdish, Syrian Democratic Forces effort to liberate Raqqa and sweep up the Euphrates Valley. And, and, and we, we've seen the regime take, take full advantage of American military success. And again, I, I, I repeat, I can't find evidence that we actually, we actually care much about that, I guess, is, 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 is what I would say. And so what, and I'm, I'm, I know this has been covered previously, so what you end up with is an Iranian-controlled land bridge arc that runs from Tehran through Iraq, through Syria, to Hezbollah-controlled Beirut. And again, I don't think any good comes of that. In fact, that is so, so sti So what you end up with, all right, is, remember Iraq, Syria, not there. Uh, you, you end up with an Alawi stand 
which is much bigger than I thought it would have been. And that's the dynamic of the last six to nine months. You, you kind of have a Shia stan that, that's what's left of Iraq. And, and I, I need to be careful here. That's not a puppet of the Iranians, but, but, a, but that part of Iraq is, is going to have to adjust its policy based upon the strength of its larger neighbor. I think we end up with a Kurdistan or two. I, you know, we'll, we'll see how it, how it shakes out. And what's missing is the Sunni stand. Now, we had a Sunni stand. We didn't like it. We couldn't live with that Sunni stand. And I, I think the only way that we don't have to go back and do this again in four years is the creation of a Sunni stand that we and the Sunnis can live with. Now, we're not talking about flags. I'm not talking about seats at the UN. But I think this group, more than most I talk to, understand the, 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 the entities that, that need to exist for us to get to stability. And I, and I fear, as good as we are at killing our enemies, we're going to have to go do it again some more in three or four or five years. So that's the second major point. A third major point, and this is maybe a little more peculiar to this, this administration is, and, and this is, a, I feel very strongly about this, and it may not be a universal view, but I'm up here, so you're going to have to hear my view. Um, this is not a clash of civilizations, and if, if we describe this as a clash of civilizations, we make this much harder to get to a happy, happy resolution. Uh, this, this is, to my mind, a war within a civilization. It's a war within a great civilization, uh, within, within Islam. It is a war, and the longer I study this, the more I'm convinced this is true. It is, it is a war that parallels the experience of Christendom in the 17th century. I mean, if you, if you just read about the Thirty Years' War, the, the Peace of Westphalia, the ending of the last great religious war within Christendom, uh, the, the parallels are overwhelming. And, and we, see, we see Islam fundamentally dealing with the same philosophical issue, the balance between faith and reason, the coercive power of the state matched up against individual belief. Now, frankly, I think it's going to be a little harder for Islam to come to grips with it than it was for Christianity. It is a more transcendental religion. Uh, we're all people of the book. We're all children of Abraham. We all came out of the same desert. But a lot of Christianity got washed through the Greeks before it got, before it got to Europe and, and, and leaves a little more space for human action and human reasoning. I'm Catholic by religious tradition. I've actually read parts of Summa Theologica, which is Aristotelian logic applied to theological questions, not a body of work that's easily found within Islam. But there are great parallels. And frankly, uh, our resolution of this was just as bloody as theirs. Depending on what historian you read, 20 to 30 percent of the population of Europe was killed uh, during the 30 years war. Uh, they just have social media. We don't. It's up, up close and personal. And so when we frame this as a clash between civilizations, I fear we animate, uh, energize, and legitimate the faction within Islam who wants it to be a clash between civilizations. Um, and that's not the faction we want to win. So I would be, so, I mean, I'm getting get modestly political on you here. Uh, immigration ban 1.0 and 2.0 fed the bad narrative, as frankly I think the President's tweets of those uh, uh, videos coming out of the uh, Britain First group feeds the narrative of those we want to defeat and makes it much harder for our friends in the region uh, to, to do what we hope they will be able to do. Now, my, my personal barometer is, is just look at Abdullah of Jordan. All right? And if he's this way, I'm that way. If he's that way, and he was very concerned about that. All right, that was Roman numeral three. I'll, I'll speed up a bit. Uh, Roman numeral four is where does this war fit into our overall priorities? Now, you spent the whole day focused on this, and so, I mean, you know, the, 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 what, the, the communicated implicit message is, wow, this is job one. Uh, and, and I did this for a long time. I don't think it is. Okay, and I, I need to share that with you. Um, when I was in government, people would say, hey, what are your priorities? And I would, this group will actually understand what I'm going to say next. I've got to decode this when I do this in Columbus, Ohio, all right? I mean, what are your priorities? CT, CP, ROW. Counterterrorism, counterproliferation, rest of the world. And, 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 and we lived that way. I, I've told the story at previous gatherings, Willem, that... Um, and I did this. I'm not blaming anybody. I, I, was, I was part of this. CIA has never looked more like uh, OSS than it does right now. All right? And 
that's good and America's safer. But I had a conversation with Dave Petraeus before he became director saying, Dave, and I told him that, you got to realize, Dave, it's not OSS, right? It's the nation's global espionage service and, and therefore has got to have a wider, wider field of view. I feared, and, and, and I'm, and I'm you know, the jury's still out. I, I feared that the, the, the President Trump's administration was going to go back to that. The fight against terrorism is the axis around which all American security and foreign policy would be formed. I fear that because that's what he said in Youngstown during the campaign. If you recall back during the campaign, I think it was August, he gave a speech in Youngstown, which was his kind of foreign policy speech. And if you read it, I mean, he, simply, he actually said, if you're fighting terrorism, you're a friend, period. And there's no other calculus that, that comes into it. Um, that means that uh, President Erdogan becomes a friend. And that means that, that the President of the United States is one of only two national leaders to call the President of Turkey after an election that fundamentally ended Turkey's 75-year experiment with democracy. I, I think we see the same dynamic with President Sisi. And by, by the way, I'm sympathetic to the problems that both the presidents of Egypt and of Turkey face. I, I get that. But I feared, based upon the speech and some of the president's actions, that the fight against terrorism and everything else is, is, is a subsidiary. I have become more hopeful, and I don't know if HR talked to, the, to about this today, but press accounts of the national security strategy actually say there are three baskets of challenges. I, I, I know you got four goals, but there were three challenges. It sounds like I'm Chinese, you know, the, the seven this and the five that. Four goals, but three challenges. And, 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 and I, I think they're actually intellectually very satisfying. One, you've got destabilizing regimes, China and Russia. Two, you've got rogue regimes like Iran and, and North Korea. Three, you've got a threat of terrorism. I think that's actually a, a very powerful and useful intellectual construct. And I'm hopeful that's the construct around which we organize our policy rather than this kind of unipolar, it's all about terrorism and everything else is a subsidiary. Uh, very briefly, the last point here, um, the, the, the character of intelligence in, in, in this world. Um, I've already mentioned, again, this is me back at Langley, remember? What, what is it I can add? I mean, there are natural consequences of the focus on terrorism that not all of which are benign. And therefore, you, you want to structurally, organizationally, bureaucratically push back against them, minimize their effect, maybe widen apertures. So that, I already told you the OSS focus and, and how that direct action role might be at the expense of, of, of other things. I, I, actually, I actually think, it's probably unfair to say it's poisoning our approach to big data, but I think it's affecting our approach to big data. Um, every time I go get a, a briefing on big data from a contractor and, and I'm out of government, I don't go back for secret briefings, but every time I get a briefing uh, on big data, it is all about disambiguation. It is, it is all about going from the ocean down to this is the Abu Ahmed you should not let get on the airplane. All right. It, it, because of the demands of the battlefield, because of the demands of, of security, I, I think it has skewed our, our approach to, to this wondrous challenge and opportunity. We are measuring our success by disambiguation, going from massive data to incredibly specific things, rather than how can it help us go this way to, for example, better predict discontinuities. Is there anything we could have done with regard to big data that would have made CIA analysts suspect that an unfortunate Tunisian fruit merchant immolating himself would lead to a million people in Tahrir Square five weeks later? Is there anything about big data that could have disturbed the analyst to suspect that there may be a discontinuity here, because I, I think the analytical track was Ben Ali knows how to do this, Ben Ali knows how to stay in power, there'll be a little bump in the road, but that's the end of it, and obviously that wasn't. Is there anything about big data that could have added to that? And I fear our approach to big data doesn't go this way, it goes that way. And then, and, then, and I, would, I wouldn't broadcast this to my staff, all right? I would quietly get my senior leadership in there, and I would talk about liaison relationships. I was director for about 31 months. I went to more than 50 countries, and a lot more than 50 came. These, these are 
These are virtuous relationships between CIA and a whole bunch of countries around the world. Now look, nobody gives us more than we give them. All right, that's ridiculous. But we get stuff we would not otherwise get if we didn't have these relationships. And, and so in, in, in the privacy of my top floor suite with my senior leadership, I would simply ask, given how much we have become dependent on liaison relationships, how much of this America first stuff may eventually push us into a position where we're gonna have to do more of this alone? And I realize that's a politically charged statement. That's why I wouldn't give it in the bubble to 400 employees. But I, but I would simply ask if, if we're, recall, I believe the magic words in the national security strategy are competitive engagement is, uh, is kind of the secret sauce, which is a little bit different from what I read in NSC 68 back in, back in the early 50s. And, and so, you know, we, we conform our movements to the movements of the American political process. And if it's more go it alone, if it's more America first, one would prudently have to think, so what does that eventually mean to in, in, li, liaison relationships? And so what might we want to think about in terms of preparing for that world in which these might be marginally at least less available? Anyway, those are the five things that, that come to mind. Um, I, I hope they're consistent with the experts. Um, uh, and with that, let me, let me just stop. And Maybe the timekeeper is here, and he's, gonna one, he's the one who's going to say we have time for one more. He just said three. So, Peter, you call on, or okay. Will, call on folks. I see an arm there. Uh, we're going to get a microphone there. And state your name and a succinct question. Hi, so my name is Robert Souza. Um, first, General Hayden, I want to thank you for the enlightening and entertaining speech. I there realize you, you are such a funny Usually guy. Usually scary, but okay, I'll take entertaining. <laughs> so um, I'm pretty. I'm interested in the Obama Plus policy, as you put yeah. it. So we often hear that U.S. troops in Syria are playing an, an advise and assist role, or they're working by, with, and through local forces on the ground. So I was wondering if you could per perhaps lift the veil and. <laughs> provide some granularity and yeah. insight into the role of American troops on the ground. Inside. Yeah, so I don't, I, don't, I don't go back for briefings, so I don't get the detailed briefing. So I, I, I would pretend that I have an informed eye reading the daily newspaper, all right? And I do have breakfast in the McLean family restaurant for every <laughs> right? and, and, and I think what we're seeing, the difference between President Obama and President Trump, but first of all, President Obama was, was on, on an arc heading towards where President Trump said, we got to be early in the administration. And what's the difference in the arc? I, I told you more resources, uh, pushing authority down to the tactical level, again, which anybody in my bloodline says that's a, great, that's a great thing. I think also what you saw, particularly early on, uh, the Obama administration would not integrate Americans lower than the brigade level, which means they're pretty divorced from the actual troops in contact. And I, I, as we went on, I think the Obama administration was more comfortable with Americans being at lower echelons. And I, I think the limits largely went off uh, with the Trump administration. So you had, you had more Americans, more forward, more integrated with forces, and, 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 and frankly, thereby, number one, giving those forces more confidence. That's an American there. They're, they're going to take care of him, even if they're not interested in taking care of me. Secondly, uh, the, the response of, of uh, of indirect fires, either from artillery or air power, you would think would be more immediate. And then finally, I mean, we're not bad at this, right? And our, our, our tactical expertise then gets applied in a, in a more immediate, meaningful way. Yeah. One question in the back there. Thank you very much, General, for your time. Rahim Rashidi from Kurdistan TV. Yes. Do you do Good you to see think, you again. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, same. Do you think a strategy, U.S. strategy, is clear on the region to push back Iran and against terrorism? Look what happened for the Kurds last October. Director of CIA was confirming Qasem Soleimani was in Kirkuk. Shia militia, Abu Mahdi Mohandes, and member of Hezbollah, 
they were used U.S. weapon, U.S. tanks to attack Peshmerga, yes. to attack civilian in Kurdistan. And really, why U.S. strategy is not clear? And that is difficult for me as Kurds, as American. Who is enemy? Who is partner? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Always good to get an open-ended, balanced question like that. You know? <laughs> um, so I, I share your concern. And I already told you about there's, there may not be indifference with regard to Iran. The choices may be hard. I've been in that room. There are no good decisions. There are only bad and badder. All right? Um, and so, so I get it. But I, I just don't see the energy with regard to this expansion of Iranian influence uh, on the ground. And so uh, when we had the fighting in Kirkuk, all right, which, which is almost simultaneous with the fall of Raqqa, all right, so as we're you know, kind of spiking the football, with, as deservedly, with the fall of Raqqa, we had two American-equipped, American-trained armies fighting one another over Kirkuk. Okay? That cannot be a happy outcome for, for American, American policy. And so um, with regard to the Iranians, with regard to Turkey, um, I mean, we have, we have allied. I mean, unarguably, we have allied with Kurdish forces to provide the bulk of our ground combat power in defeating, defeating ISIS. I think we have a sense of indebtedness to the Kurds. Um, and so, and, and I already told you the dissolution of regions and we're going to end up with entities. And, and so I think, I think actually, uh, in addition to how do you push back against Iran, I, I think we deserve a, a serious discussion with our Turkish friends, I underline Turkish friends, right, to, to they're going to be Kurdistan. Now, what is it we want to jointly work toward to make an autonomous Kurdistan acceptable to the government, to the government of Turkey? I think that's a, that's a legitimate, serious conversation, the outcome of which is hard to predict. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a necessary thing. But, it, but it's back to, to, to my original point on the, on the whole question. We know how to kill our enemies. Right? And, and we just efficiently proved it. Now can we create a, a structure on the ground there that provides sufficient stability that we don't have to go back and do it again? And uh, to me, the question of Kurdistan, the Turks pushing back on the Iranians are all, all core to that. And again, let me, let me repeat. All right? I've been in the room. This is not easy. I'm being critical because it's easy to be critical from the outside. One more, the last question. I saw the first arm going up there. So, uh, Nick, you get to ask the question, but you must wait for the uh, uh, microphone. Thanks very much. Uh, Nicholas Vita, I have no affiliation. I'm just here because I'm interested. Um, I was at a, I attended dinner uh, with Henry Kissinger, and he was posed a similar question to a, a comment you made about the clash of civilizations. And his response was, in the Judeo tradition, uh, Christian tradition, you know, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, render under God what is God's. And he's, he basically took the polar opposite view of you. And there was a theme I heard throughout the day uh, where it appeared there was a, a lack of, uh, not empathy, but ability to see the world from the other side's shoes. And so, you know, one of the comments in one of the slides were, the Spanish uh, media reported that people couldn't believe that the terrorists who perpetrated that, that terrible act uh, weren't fully integrated because they appeared to be so. Um, there were other examples you know, about you know, how did we get the Arab Spring, spring wrong. And the question is, are, you're, you're looking for a way to sort of marginalize that last 18 yards on the, uh, on the football field. Um, are we looking at this too much from the perspective of sort of the American tradition yeah. of you know, embracing those those fundamental freedoms, or is there is there a sacrifice you have to make in order to preserve? Because I'm sure there are family members who would, again, take the other view because right. their loved ones were impacted by that type of violence. No, no, I, I I agree, and I try to suggest at the beginning that you know Christianity, Christendom arrived at a certain at a certain compromise, which was separating the course of power of the state from questions of theology. Now. We did that imperfectly. There are a bunch of spikes in Western history since then. But fundamentally, that's the plan. All right? And, and then coming out of 1648 and the Peace of Westphalia was the concept of the secular nation state as the, as the absolute guaranteed organizing principle for political activity on the planet. And oh, by the way, I grew up believing that was settled, that that's just how things were going to be. 
and it, it, it's, it's not. And that come, now we come back to, to your question. And so now you've got another great monotheism uh, in, 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 which, in, in which they actually view the role of the state in questions of religion to be more robust, more legitimate than the broad Western civilization response to that. All right? I, uh, this leads you deeply into, into philosophy and history. You know, it's, it's not the kind of stuff that's on Intel Link, all right? Uh, and and I, I've actually talked to a bunch of, bunch of philosophers who actually said that, that Western tolerance, all right, was, um, was the child of necessity following the Protestant Reformation, all right, that, that, that you, couldn't, you just could not enforce rigid unitary ideology, and, and therefore we, we made a virtue out of necessity. We became a tolerant society because we had no other, no other choice. We'll, we'll see where, where Islam goes. I would offer you this thought, though, to make this even more complicated and more troubling. Right? The modern Western democracy that most allows religion in the public square, this one. All right? Um, I'm, I'm Catholic by religious tradition. I march here in January trying to over, overturn a decision by the Supreme Court as to what it is they think is an absolute constitutional right. Uh, the right, the right to abortion. Uh, American evangelicals are the strongest portion of this population supporting this, a unitary state of Israel because God says so. It's, it has nothing to do with, with policy and, and politics. It is, it is mandated, uh, mandated by their, their belief in God. And so we have accommodated in, in American democracy, a, a fairly powerful element of religion in, in popular, popular discussion. And, and so th there, are mo there are outcomes out there, all right, that, that, that will look different than the caliphate, but don't look as secular as post-revolutionary France. And, and so one, one hopes that this other great monotheism in their own time, at their own pace, get to something that both we and, and they view as, as healthy. And in the meantime, we have a right to defend ourselves. And, and we've, we've got to go do that. Well, please join me in thanking General Hayden. <laughs>